everyone, if you're anywhere in the Northeastern United States on October 25th, 2019, please join me at the first annual Tate Behavioral Conference in Springfield, Massachusetts. This will be a single-track conference that features podcast favorites such as Megan Miller, Ryan O'Donnell, and Kim Behrens. And I'll be doing my own talk as well. I'm going to share some observations and lessons that I've learned with this uh, whole podcasting experience and also be trying to summarize the uh, advice for the newly minted that uh, usually happens at the end of each episode. So I'm in the process of preparing it right now, and I'm really excited to share it with you. Uh, we close the event with a live taping of the Behavioral Observations podcast in which I'll be interviewing Dr. Kim herself. So a good time should be had by all. So for more information, go to behavioralobservations.com forward slash Tate 2019. I hope to see you there. All right, on to today's episode. Boy, am I so thrilled to announce that Greg Hanley is back on the podcast. We cover so many topics in this wide-ranging conversation that I can't possibly preview all of them here. Long story short, you're going to want to listen to this one from beginning to end as there are so many valuable lessons embedded in this interview. Greg also mentions a ton of papers, and I think that instead of linking each one individually in the show notes, I'll link the publications page to Greg's dissemination website, practicalfunctionalassessment.com. And I'll link any other things outside of that at uh, the show notes for this episode as well. So if you need to look that stuff up, just go to behavioralobservations.com and search on this episode number. And then real quickly, I want to thank Behavior University and Go Lotus for sponsoring today's episode. We'll hear more about them later on in the interview. But for podcast-specific discounts, freebies, and so forth, you can visit behavioruniversity.com forward slash observations and golotus.com forward slash register. All right, I think that's it for announcements. So without any further ado, please enjoy this fun conversation with Greg Hanley. Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now, here's your host, Matt Sicoria. Greg, welcome back to the program. Number four, thanks for coming back. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for having me. Oh, man. Uh, you know, I think it's been uh, about two and a half years or so since uh, the last time you've been on the show. So this episode will be somewhere in the nineties. Uh, and I think the last one you were on was, was episode 20 where we just did like a listener Q and a. And so, yeah. um, a, a lot has happened between now and then. And I thought it'd be fun to catch up with you and hear all that, uh, that's been going on with you. So, um, so having said that, I'd, I'd, I'd like to just kind of open the show. And I know you've had some changes going on with your, uh, your, you know, some of your professional activities and there's been a lot of research that's been published between now and then. So, uh, why don't you take the first uh, couple of minutes here and just kind of catch us up on what's new with, with Greg Hanley. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I know you've, uh, you've been very busy since last we talked. I'm really impressed. You're up to 90 something podcasts and, uh, I tell you, I don't go a single place without someone bringing up, bringing up the podcast. And so again, I, I just have to give you kudos, man. You've, uh, you took something on and, and in a blind sort of way, hoping that it might have some uh, merit. And I'm sure you didn't realize all that you've contributed, you would have contributed by doing this, but you've contributed amazing amounts of content uh, to behavior analysts. And uh, I'm very appreciative. And I know there are hundreds, thousands probably of people who are uh, appreciative too. So um, again, uh, thanks for doing this and, and starting this and taking that risk. Um, oh, thanks, man. I appreciate that. And uh, you know, it's one of those things where I think having your help with this, you know, it's not an accident that the three most top uh, downloaded shows in all the shows that we've published thus far uh, featured you as an interview subject. So uh, you know, a lot of you, you should share in a lot of the credit because you have a, a message that's resonated with the field. And yeah, that's cool. So, um, I, I, and you've always been generous with your time as it relates to the podcast. So um, cool. Yeah. Thank you, Matt. 
Cool. Well, uh, let's see what's new. Uh, this has been a pretty crazy, uh, I guess, six to nine months uh, in the sense that I, my university uh, position, uh, I decided to end it uh, as far as an administrator and full-time professor um, and start a company. Uh, but I'm still a faculty member, a research professor at uh, Western New England University, and I still have advisees, doctoral students. So I'm still conducting research. And I still sit on committees, thank goodness, because uh, there's a lot of good learning. We have a great faculty and great students. So I sit on thesis and dissertation committees as well, which is super. Uh, and so that'll continue. I'm still taking new students and whatnot. Um, so none of that will change. I'm just not administering or teaching and uh, or receiving much of a check. So, <laughs> I see. so yes, a little bit of risk there. Um, but anyways, I started this uh, company. It's called FTF Behavioral Consulting. And the mission is simply to disseminate good practice and practices that uh, my group is particularly adept at uh, training and supporting people on. And those are obviously uh, practical functional assessment to address the severe problem behavior, intractable stereotypy, sleep problems, um, mealtime problems. And then we have our kind of prevention aims, and those are... Uh, found in those curricula called preschool life skills or balance. So as a team, uh, we go out individually or as a group uh, or as just a couple of us and we go on site to companies and we do a training day. Uh, but more importantly, we do implementation support and it's a lot of fun. I did, it, I did it in the past, but it was hard to schedule it. It was hard to convince companies that it was important, right? They, most people just want the training. They think that through some interactive lecture, uh, that, that things are going to be great afterwards and new processes will be adopted in their programs, culture, and whatnot. And it's just, it's a little harder than that. And so uh, with this company on these day twos, we call them implementation days, we ask that they pick the clients that are on the radar, uh, usually the, the most challenging client or the most expensive client and the one that's kind of flummoxing folks. And as a team, we collaborate and do the assessment process live together. And we invite parents in and it's very open. It's very transparent. And we do three or four of them in a day. And then the team uh, supports people weekly until we get a socially meaningful outcome, hopefully, which is usually the case. Uh, and it, it's just a much better process. It's more satisfying because we feel like we're creating uh, true capacity building and we're making a difference for the individual kids at the same time. So you're getting kind of a couple reinforcers in there. So yeah. that's the gist of the company. Uh, yeah, can, it's I, can I ask you real quick? You, so you're saying yeah. we, so talk a little bit about the team a little bit. How many people yeah, are good. with you and how are these people selected and things like that? Yeah. Well, they're really, they, they, they are selected really uh, early on. So I've known everyone that works in this very small company for quite some time. And uh, many of which were in uh, training programs. We were in the training programs together. Uh, so uh, Kelsey Rubel and Holly Gober uh, are two folks who are fellows at the Western England University. And they're finishing up uh, their doctoral work pretty much this month, next month. And uh, they are two of our lead consultants. Uh, Shannon Ward is another student of mine. She's worked at NAC. She's been working in Abu Dhabi for quite some time. She's coming back uh, next month, and she'll be working with the company. Uh, Mashida Gayamagami, she worked with me a while back. She was out in the West Coast, but she's back, and she will soon be working with the company. And uh, Tony Camilleri was a, is a good friend of mine, but uh, we were colleagues at Kansas. And he was a student of Don Bouchel, Don Bears, and also worked in my lab. And uh, he's run a whole bunch of different schools over time, but he's with the group too, which gives us some nice uh, breath. You know, we're a little more adept at the school-based uh, stuff and about school culture building and things like that. And so it's uh, Holly, Kelsey, myself, Tony, and Mashid and Shannon. And then I have a, a few students that are pitching in as well, our more senior students. So. Uh, pretty much we we don't we just have folks who have PhDs or close to having PhDs and then we go out and collaborate with companies. And so there's no in between. I don't have RBTs and master's students. Uh, it's not that kind of company. We, we just go out and collaborate. And so I need people who've done research, know and have done multiple cases and have some practical and clinical breadth. And all these people have that. And uh, we're based in Worcester uh, in an old building. As you can see, the re you know, listeners can't, but you can see we're in this old uh, 
kind of historic building in Worcester, and uh, it's fun. It's a real breath of fresh air for me to be around this talent, and and we're seeing so many kids. We're supporting so many kids right now that we're learning a lot about our processes. And research is a great way to learn about our processes, and we obviously use that to refine it. But the, the if you're systematic in your approach, every case teaches something, and that's the case with, with our process right now. And so we are getting so much better at this because of the opportunities afforded to us by the companies that we relate to. So, yeah, it's going really well. And, uh, yeah, that's that. So what is the, so the geographic region you're serving is generally in the new England area, or do you do stuff out? Um, do you travel to, on, you know, to cases, uh, you know, that, that are more far flung than that? Yeah, good. We, our mission is to disseminate good practice far and wide. And so my goal is to have at least 50% of our relationships be international. And so we've wow. uh, been to about 20 countries, uh, Upcoming in the next few months, we'll be going to Italy, Nicaragua, uh, Israel, Russia. Uh, and so we, we have a lot of, um, we put a lot of effort into developing relationships with people outside the U.S. Uh, we find it highly rewarding to work with pioneers, I call them. They're pioneers. They're people that are starting to get ABA off the ground in their country and these people are amazing to me, the, the risks that they take and uh, and then the burdens they take on for our field and for the children or adults with uh, problem behavior or other issues that behavior analysts deal with in their country. And so half of our uh, relationships, again, are out, out of the country, I'd say. Uh, but we work with a lot of states. I think Michigan and New York are probably the states for whatever accidental reason we go to the most. But we we travel anywhere. That's that's part of the reason the name is FTF. There's several reasons that you can, people can see on the website. but. Uh, but part of FTF is uh, face to face. And so we get on a plane and we go there. I used to have people visit our clinic uh, at Western New England. And it was a lot of effort on everybody's part. And when all was said and done, I think people went back to their own space and said, wouldn't it be nice if we had exactly what they had to do this process? And it almost taught the wrong thing. And so now that we go to places, we figure out with whatever resources people have, how to do the process. I don't care what personnel you have, what letters they have after their name, whether you have a session room, don't have a session room, have electronics, don't have electronics, it doesn't matter. Just we go in, we collaborate with you and the resources you have, and we make it work. And uh, it's just so much better that way than the kind of, uh, I guess, dog and pony show that, that sometimes I participated in, in the past. I see. So, uh, with reg I'm fascinated by the international aspect of this. Um, how how are people finding you, Greg? <laughs> uh, I don't know. They don't tell me. I'm sure they think I'm a little crazy, uh, which they'd be accurate. Uh, I know what you're saying, though. I know you're not asking that. How do they find us? How do they find the company? F FDF. Uh, we finally have a website, uh, and so some people are now finding us through the website, which is ftfbc.com. And um, so th there's a fillable form there. Uh, that's one way. But to be honest, Matt, uh, people just reach out to me. They find my email and um, and they reach out. And I'm terrible with emails sometimes. In fact, right now I'm between emails, uh, companies. And so there's always issues there. But uh, people reach out. I think they figure things out through your podcast. Uh, <laughs> really, I, I do believe that the podcast is probably responsible for a lot of the folks reaching out. I think uh, publishing and articles uh, is also responsible. And then sometimes I don't do this as much anymore. I like going to companies, doing company-centric or school-centric or hospital-centric trainings, but sometimes going to like APBA conference or something of the sort where people from around the world come in, uh, that's a way we connect to, I think. So probably those three mechanisms. I see. I see. And um, given your, I guess, visibility in the field, uh, are, are people, are you beating people away with sticks, uh, you know, to, to get help or, you know, what I, I can imagine that, you know, opening this opportunity to make yourself and your team more available, you know, beyond the, uh, the university and beyond, you know, the, the, typical areas in which you've practiced must, must be quite, uh, there must be an, an insatiable market for it, I guess. 
Well, man, I, w- I hope that's the, I hope you're the case. That's the case. Uh, we want we want good business, right? And what I mean by good business is we want people who want to collaborate on creating socially meaningful outcomes uh, through ABA and with respect to the problems that we are decent at helping people with. And so right now we we have a lot of great relationships, but I have we have a lot of good people on the team right now. So we're up six seven. I have some part time folks. And, um, and so right now, the only issue is trying to find the calendar space. And, uh, and so sometimes we have to push trainings back a bit. Uh, but uh, let me be clear, if someone calls us, we will figure out a way to work with them. It's not a matter of if, it's a, just a matter of when, and it's a matter of who. And uh, this is a little kind of strange thing to share, but I'm gonna share it. I think sometimes people, you asked me a question, uh, a while back about, you know, people and deify, deifying people, uh, your word, uh, in the field. And I worry about that. And I worry about it with this company. I think sometimes people think they need me to come out. Like I have some kind of special sauce that I sprinkle on the problem. And, the and I really mind, don't. Jedi mind trick. That's exactly right. What I have is a good process. And I have a good process because I paid attention to years and years of research and I practiced and, you know, made a lot of mistakes along the way and arrived at something that, that simply works. And then my team has refined it and they know how to do it. And for them, it also simply works. And so sometimes people get pushed out on the calendar because they want me to come out uh, when any one of my teammates could do exactly what I can do. I know they can because they've proven it but because we train each other and we hold each other to high standards. And I think uh, I give it a little bit of time and then I think that'll be realized. And my only fear is that they're going to realize that my teammates are often better than I am and they're never going to request me anymore. Right. So you, you, you have too much of it. And then next thing you know, you may have none of it. So I got to walk that line carefully. I, I want to be able to collaborate with people too. Uh, and I, I hope and, and think that'll probably be the case for some time. But I, I have colleagues here who are highly effective uh, at the processes we support people on. And, uh, and we, what we do now, Matt, is we go out together. That's how we build relationships. And, and we're often better as a team, especially on implementation support day. There's something about having two people there, one person with a client and the parent or the teacher and the other person in the room kind of describing what's happening. And we use some video technology so we can share and make the process transparent to every member of the company. And uh, there's something about having both people there. And so that's been really fun. We travel together and then our constituents see, oh, wow, these folks are really effective. Uh, Kelsey, Holly, Shannon, Tony, Mashi. And, uh, and so again, good problem to have, but, this company is not Greg Hanley's company. This is not a Hanley process. This is FTF's the company. PFA maybe is the process. Uh, and it's about the process, not the people. It is about the people. I got good people. But they're, they're I'm giving a talk at Babbitt. I, I know I'm going off the rails a little bit here. I get, I'm giving a talk at Babbitt. It's on rapport building. And uh, maybe no one will come if I give the main thesis, but I'm going to give the thesis. You can be a nice person and do all this tactical rapport building stuff. If you're not naturally a nice person, you have to adapt (laughs) adapt some tactical uh, maneuvers and all that. Or you can simply embrace a process that builds relationships. And that's what we have. We have a process that you can't help but build a relationship because the process leads to the rapport. And that's why I don't worry about um, whether it's me or someone else on my team because the process you know, develops a relationship and you know, builds the rapport and, and gets things done properly. Are you ready to make the leap from pen and paper into the digital world? Or are you frustrated by your current system? Well, I recommend you go check out Go Lotus. Go Lotus was created by a product development expert who spent years building systems for Apple and Microsoft before her child was diagnosed with autism. But creating Go Lotus, she had one mission in mind create a platform that could help therapists better treat their kiddos by providing a tool that allows them to focus on the actual work and not the paperwork. Go Lotus is an intuitive, easy to use, and dare I say beautiful system. It handles every aspect of practice management from data tracking and automatic soap notes to scheduling and billing. It's so simple your entire team can be up and running in less than an hour. 
For more information, go to golotus.com forward slash register. And by using the promo code MATT, the first 100 people will receive 90 days of our data trackers completely free. And by signing up, you'll then receive an additional 25% off the first 12 months. So again, for more information, head on over to golotus.com forward slash register. Well, I don't think you'll spoil the attendance any by giving the, the headline away or the, the <laughs> I think I think people would hear you show up to read names out of the phone book, but that's neither here nor there. Actually, I think I do have a question or some comments there about some uh, 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 presenting skills and things like that. So let's we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, sure. But I'm, I'm just fascinated with this, this, the, 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 uh, the company aspect of this. So um, what, what have you learned? Cause you're, you're the CEO of this, this organization. And uh, you know, so uh, I think a few months ago when I think it was right after you decided to make this change, you hadn't quite left your position at the university or at least what you were doing, the teaching aspect of it and whatnot. Um, so I guess I have two questions. One is you had some interesting commentary that I'm wondering if you're willing to share about how you arrived at the decision to make this big change in your life. Yeah. Um, and I thought that was, uh, I, I think there's some lessons in, in that. And then secondly, what, what have you learned being the CEO, uh, starting a company, managing a team, and, and things like that? So if you can address either or both of those, that would be great. Sure. Well, let me take the second one first. Um, I mean, what I really learned is it's fun. Uh, I'll be honest, man, I, I'm, having, I'm having a little fun because I have to stretch. Uh, I have to do things that I don't necessarily have the skills for, and so I have to go online and and uh, I've taken some free courses uh, that people, you know, some universities in uh, New England put online to learn a little bit about business and, and whatnot. So I've enjoyed that. I've enjoyed stretching. I've enjoyed being ignorant and having to fill in some spaces. And so that's been cool. Um, the main thing I've learned is I need help, uh, that this can't be done alone. And that's what I was trying to do, Matt, for years is kind of do this as a side gig out of my basement. You know, while I'm trying to, you know, run a program and be a professor, et cetera. And I was really selling everyone short, including myself, because there were certain times I would get on a plane and it wouldn't be as rewarding because I was just doing a training. I was really, uh, I think I was entertaining sometimes more than training. And, and I'm, all, I'm about outcomes. And if I go do a training and six months from now, I don't have any evidence that a single child was positively affected by that experience, it bums me out a little bit. I don't know if it was worth the uh, time. And, and so I'm kind of combining the answers here. Go what, ahead, I learned, yeah, ahead. what I learned about the company was just, uh, it's fun to do something different. And uh, at some point in your career, you need that. Uh, I, I worry about behavior analysts, career trajectories. I worry about burnout. And whether you're a professor or whether you're a clinician or administrator, there we have a tough job. We, we are burdened with other people's problems. And yeah. it's very important to diversify what you do so you keep the love for what you do going. And, uh, and that's happened uh, to me for me, and I'm very fortunate that it has. And again, uh, to push yourself into areas where you don't know things is also relatedly very healthy. And it also was humbling and it taught me what I'm good at and things I need help with. And it makes you humble enough to bring on people to help you. And, uh, and I've really enjoyed that part. And I like seeing my colleagues grow because they also are stretching and they're doing things that maybe they hadn't done in the past or think they could have done. And they're doing exceptional with it. So this kind of growth that we're all experiencing is highly rewarding. Um, as far as leaving, I mean, it was a really hard decision. I've been thinking about it for years. What, what really did it, Matt, was I just put down, you know, every now and then you, you get go in your basement office like you and I do, and uh, you have a few minutes, and so you write down, well, what are my reinforcers in general? And then what are my professional reinforcers? And to what extent am I living a life where I'm, where I'm producing those reinforcers? And what I was finding was I was spending a whole lot of time doing things that were not consistent with my reinforcers or with my values, if you were, if you will. And so 
as I wrote down this list, I tried to design my ideal professional time allocation. You know, how could I allocate my time? And then I realized that I might be better off running a business uh, and be in a better position to get those uh, reinforcers than if I was in the university. And some people might be thinking, oh, uh, you mean money. <laughs> and I really don't. Uh, I probably would be better off financially uh, having stayed at my university, which is a great place. Um, what I'm talking about is what I'm doing on a regular basis. Who am I talking to? Who am I training? How much client contact do I have? How often do I get to speak with a family? How often do I get to be with the, ch the child with the, with the problem? Um, and I'm doing more of what I want to do now. And uh, so I'm really happy about that. Don't get me wrong. I love teaching and I, and I didn't mind running a program. It was fun. But, but right now, uh, this is a better place. And I'm doing things that are definitely more rewarding. And, uh, and again, there's something about being humbled that is rewarding. And that's also what's happening. You get a little isolated. You get a little insulated in the classroom. You get a lot of head nodding. And that's it. Well, you know, when I go on the road, they don't have to say we agree. They don't have to say we love this. They're basically saying prove it. Prove it. And I meet with some people who are highly anxious, who are scared about doing analyses for good reason. Uh, they don't believe that this child has the ability to not engage in problem behavior for an extended amount of time. They don't believe the child has the ability to be off antipsychotics and learn skills and be an effective member of their family and community. And I have some odd belief that pretty much everyone I meet can and will if we're just patient enough and do the right processes. And so the challenge is there. And I'm just getting more of that um, now. And so my colleagues and, and that's really fun. So that was on my list. And, and uh, that really is ultimately what pushed me towards this. I'm allocating my time towards things that are more valuable to me. Wow. What a cool process and what a, what a neat way to think through how to spend your time, how to make a difficult decision and things like that. So uh, I appreciate you uh, sharing some of that kind of, uh, I guess, personal reflection uh, cause I think yeah, there's, again, there's some value for the listeners out there, uh, you know, in particular as folks get into their career, you know, five, 10, 15 years down the road. And, you know, like you said, the, 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 the risk for burnout and, you know, uh, is certainly there. And that's certainly a topic yeah. that we're seeing lots and lots about. Um, as a matter of fact, I just had, I just interviewed Steve Hayes and we spent a, a considerable amount of time talking about burnout and, um, uh, you know, things like that. So uh, I saw that advertise. I have to listen. I mean, Steve Hayes is a good example of someone who shifted gears multiple times in his career. And I think that's what keeps him young. Right. Oh, for sure. For sure. So, um, one of the things that's pretty cool that happened recently, I, I don't actually have the new edition of Cooper yet. I, I will at some point or another, but from what I understand, uh, the, the, the ISCA or, uh, maybe the rebranded, uh, name, uh, pr practical functional assessment is, is featured in it. Is that true? I, I've heard that too, Matt. Uh, like you, I haven't seen it, uh, but I have uh, people who've uh, seen it and uh, told me about it. I'm really happy. I, I, I assume there was some co-authors. Uh, I think Stephanie Peterson may have been involved and, you know, she's a really good colleague and perhaps she was the influence. I really don't know. But, uh, you know, it's, it's an honor. Hey, listen, man, it's an honor when anyone reads any article that I'm, uh, my group publishes or I'm affiliated with. Uh, it's an honor when someone writes about it. It's a super honor when people replicate, which there's a lot of people replicating uh, our work lately, which we, I, it, it, there's little more reinforcing than that, right? I, I love seeing that. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's cool. Uh, you know, there's still a massive buffet out there of things to do when presented with the opportunity to address problem behavior. I'm still worried about the buffet. I, I am. So I'll, I'm happy that people are recognizing uh, some of the processes that we tend to uh, uh, champion for lack of a better term, but I'm still not satisfied. I guess <laughs> I just think there's just, there's just too much going on in ABA bill that I'm worried about right now. And, um, but I'll, I'll take the small wins and uh, being recognized and the, arguably the most important textbook in our field. Hey, that's cool. 
Um, talk about the, 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 the change. And I know this is probably like splitting hairs or what have your semantics, but maybe it's not. And, uh, so talk about the rebranding of the actual name. I know even we, even when you first came on the pro- program and we're talking about the ISCA, you, you were, you were, as you were talking about it, you were apologizing for the, 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 the uh, I guess, funky nomenclature and difficult. Yeah, it's a terrible uh, acronym. It's yeah. Horrible. Acronym. Yeah. Uh, so that, yeah. Were the, were there other reasons for, for, for kind of calling it something else or t- well, talk about the evolution of that term? Sure. Well, it's pretty simple. I mean, the term term came about just because uh, better terms were taken. I couldn't call it the brief. I couldn't get on it. It was <laughs> right. like real simple terms were already taken and you know, th- that's the way it is. And uh, you know, I picked it only because it, it, uh, tacted the features of the process that at that moment in time in the literature were made it uh, distinguishable and so interview informed everyone you know half the people we came out was saying well of course everyone does an interview and then the other half of the people say interviews are subjected and garbage so <laughs> we got like very different feedback on whether the interview was relevant irrelevant assumed never to be done so for me, the interview is critical. And so interview and form need to be emphasized because every analysis is distinctive. Every analysis is personalized to the child. You obviously need to interview people to get that. So that's where the II comes from. And then synthesized, um, that too, we didn't realize it until we did a review paper a couple of years ago, has been lurking in the literature for years, but synthesized re- uh, contingencies are just combining reinforcers. And the more I look, look, the more I realized that all reinforcers that behavior analysts have been using, even those who publish in Java, are synthesized. It's almost impossible to isolate a reinforcement contingency. You have to have multiple control conditions to prove that. No one has multiple control conditions in their analyses. So technically, everyone's doing synthesis. So again, what I thought was unique, interview and form, synthesized contingency, perhaps wasn't. I, I think the part that's unique is the fact that we're aggressively tacting those features as opposed to letting them sit back in the background unstated. And so that's where the ugly word comes from, interview and form, synthesize contingency. We want to emphasize that it is indeed an analysis, although it may not look like others you've read about. And so <clears throat> the ISCO was an important name. I think it's still accurate. Now, the problem with it is that it's so clunky. And I'll tell you where it really came from. I have a colleague, uh, Ron Leaf, and he is been around a long time and runs Autism Partnership with John McCacken and and uh, Justin Leaf uh, runs their research department and uh, Justin and I were uh, overlapped at the University of Kansas and Toby Mountjoy runs their Pacific uh, Rim companies and he's a great leader too that probably people don't know as much about but uh, I interacted with this group a handful of times and uh, Ron was telling me how clunky ISCO was just in general but also uh, in court cases and in other ways of communicating what we do. And I believe it was him, I may have this wrong, but I believe Ron was like, why don't I just call it PFA? Because in your presentations, that's what you emphasize. And I said, okay, that's a good call. And so I think that was that conversation really moved me in that direction. And I'm also in my group and I are traveling in circles now where sometimes there aren't any behavior analysts. We do trainings with non-behavior analysts, a bunch of professionals that do not have a BCBA. And I'm trying uh, very hard to talk like a normal person to these folks and PFA just works better. Uh, whatever name you pick though, Matt, and you probably understand this, most people understand this, whatever name you pick, you're going to tick somebody off. Because by calling it a practical functional assessment, that means that if you're not doing it, yours is impractical. Now, in this case, that's probably true. But that said, there is no perfect name. So I'm moving on. PFA is what it is. Let's move on. And, and we just know we have a process here. Uh, and, uh, and usually requires that we get together to teach people how to do the process anyway. And so we're, we're well past the name, but, but anyways, that's the history as far as I can recollect it. All right, cool. Yeah. Uh, you know, I want to talk about what's new with the process or, you know, cause obviously we, we, you know, our original conversations about this, have you know, kind of dated back several years. Uh, but before we do, I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask, uh, the, uh, another question, kind of like a, you know, kind of housekeeping question, if you will. But, um, and I, I'm, I'm not saying this to be provocative or anything like that, but I, but I did, um, when I was at ABAI, 
Um, it was, and I've heard, it, 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 it was overheard like, you know, third or fourth hand or something like that. Uh, so I don't know the veracity of it, but there were some people saying some really un, uh, uh, unkind things about, <laughs> about the ISCA practical functional assessment, whatever you want to call it, the work that your group is doing, uh, and others who, who picked up the mantle to move it forward. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't want you to address those comments, uh, specifically, uh, cause I don't, you know, but, but I guess my, my deeper question here is, you know, what, what message would, do you have for students and, and, uh, and, and, and other practitioners are trying to figure out, they're going to the literature, they're seeing these kind of competing views about how to deal with, with, with problematic behavior. Um, and you know, there's some trash talking going on and things like that by, by the so-called grownups, you know, talk, talk about, you know, what, I guess, what, what advice would you have for someone who's coming up in the field and trying to figure out, gosh, how do I, how do I reconcile all these, these, these points of view on this? Yeah, that's the question, Matt. You know, I, yeah, there were some things that Abba and I, I, I don't know exactly what said. I wasn't there. In fact, the, the, we had a, our own symposia scheduled at the same time, which is, you know, I assume by chance. But um, but anyways, yeah, people are saying harsh things. Um, clearly, I clearly strike a nerve when I go on the road and say to do a traditional functional analysis is not defensible anymore. I'll even uh, push it now to say I think it borders on unethical. And those are the words I'll be using now that I'm my own person. I'm not representing Java, and I'm not representing a university. And so uh, the things I've said before, to be honest, are quite tempered. Uh, not that I'm taking the lid off. It'll never be ad hominem as some others make it. I simply talk about process. And the process that we use is safe, it's dignified, and it's televisable. I can put anything we do on TV and I'd be proud of it. And I think people would see it and say, I want that for my kids. That's the ABA I want. And I don't think I can say that about other processes I've used in the past. And I don't think you can say that about a lot of ways to do functional analysis and treatment. And so uh, because of those distinctions, I'm fairly confident in our process and I don't get worried by other people's rhetoric. This is a high stakes sort of thing for people. There are things at stake that are fairly obvious, like financial things and legacy and whatnot, and a bunch of theses and dissertations sitting in file cabinets that have yet to be published. So I get all where that's coming from. But that said, I feel poorly uh, for two groups. I feel poorly for my students. Sometimes I feel like I've screwed them by affiliating them with me and having them uh, do this work and become so impassioned about it because they see how effective it is and they answer research questions that are gratifying, but yet they don't get a lot of reinforcers like I did when I was a student and like uh, some of my students did before we started doing these processes. So I feel poorly for them, but at the same time, I think it makes them stronger and it makes them very thoughtful. It makes them really good professionals and it makes them really understand what they're doing and why they're doing it. And so maybe there's a penny there. The other group I feel poorly for is the group you mentioned, practitioners or people that unfortunately are sitting in a talk where something's being uh, demonized and then they go to another talk and it's being celebrated. And it's very hard to figure out, well, what do I do now? And so I don't have a great answer, but I appreciate you asking the question because it made me think. I think the first thing I'd say to folks is just appreciate that your field that you're in is young and it's dynamic. Thank goodness. If it was static and we all just agreed on exactly how we should proceed, that would be a dangerous field. Okay, so uh, with some mutation, with some variability, will come selection of better things and thank goodness. So if anything, the disagreement, you know, probably should be celebrated. The difference is, is to be appreciated. But practically speaking, beyond celebrating the little bit of variability going on, I think people need to read the actual articles. I think people need to be very careful of the rhetoric. I don't want them to listen to what I say either and get too pumped up. Don't get too jazzed. Read the articles. And when people assert something that seems kind of strong, go to the literature. And it, 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 it seems like a hard thing to do. 
but you don't have to read all the articles. There's just a handful of articles out there. Uh, there's a couple articles by Dr. Jessica Slayton, for instance. A lot of people like to talk to me about the Fisher paper. That Fisher did a paper and showed that the ISCO was worthless. And I was a reviewer. I'm not going to get into the details, but that paper proves nothing. And uh, if you read Slayton's uh, work, it extends that uh, Fisher's paper by applying treatment. And then she also has a review paper that talks about the nature of synthesized contingencies and their prevalence and their inevitability, et cetera. Those are two papers I, I'd have people take a look at. Uh, I'd have people get in groups in their organizations and you know have their journal clubs and whatnot and read articles and come up with your own impressions. I'd also ask people to be empirical. Try one assessment process, try the other assessment process and see how it works for you and do things systematically. Ultimately, people have to defend their own practice. I've been saying that for quite some time. All I do is go around defending my practice and then training people on it. But I can defend my practice. I can defend my practice because I've had the luxury of being able to do research on it. I've had the luxury of being old, and so I've done different versions of it. I have the luxury of time to read the literature. And so it's going to take some time to defend your own practice, but you have to defend it not based on what someone said through a microphone at a conference. That is the weakest form of evidence. You have to defend it by reading the articles and looking at the data in the articles, not just the interpretation written in the discussion section. Okay, It's about looking at the data and forming your own impressions and then being empirical, trying these things on for size, looking at your outcomes, and then over time, organizations, people, practitioners will be able to defend their practice. So that's the advice I give. Celebrate the fact that it's happening, that we're not static, that there, is, there are options here. Look at the data in the literature, not just how it's interpreted in the text. And then finally, try it on for size in a community. Don't be a cowboy. Or, I don't know what I use all sorts of weird mixed metaphors. Don't be doing this in a, alone in your garage. You know, in a community, do different analytic and treatment processes and see how it works out. Um, that's the advice I give. Are you in need of continuing education? Well, Behavior University is a BACB approved continuing ed provider, and their mission is to provide university quality courses and ABA for new and experienced professionals alike. Their live webinars generally have a limited number of attendees so that the learning experience is highly interactive. And if you can't make the live events, these webinars are recorded and available in Behavior University's CEU library for later viewing. Behavior University also has a 40-hour RBT training. This self-paced course uses a combination of visual presentation, audio lectures, and live video models to teach all areas of the RBT task list. The course is accessible anytime and from anywhere. So if you'd like to learn more, head on over to behavioruniversity.com forward slash observations, where you'll find a 10% discount for podcast listeners. Again, that's behavioruniversity.com forward slash observations. And thanks for checking them out. All right. Very good. That's cool. Um, so bef uh, before we get into the questions, and I've got a bunch of questions here from the, uh, the membership group. Great. Uh, and thank you guys for um, uh, helping me with the, the heavy lifting of interview prep. Um, <laughs> and, uh, so let, let's, before we get into those, let's talk about where the, the, the this process stands right now uh, as a po and how it might have, if, if, if it has evolved since, we were last talking about it in 2017. Yeah. I mean, there, there are a lot of changes and, and, uh, and I feel, I also feel badly about that. I wish we could just package it. People are like, when are you writing that manual? And I have it, but every time we have it, we have to change it. And so I'm, I'm not willing to pull the trigger on it, but now I realize that you can kind of self publish through Google. So maybe that's the way we'll do it. And then we can just print out new versions every week. Google doc. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, but uh, that said, we are going to publish a manual on this, and I think we're we're damn close right now. But the the changes are articulated best in our trainings, uh, to be frank, because it's a nuanced process. That said, we have that free website, 
practicalfunctionalassessment.com. And now the company is going to take over updating that. We'll always have a free website, and we are poised to update it in the next you know, four to six weeks with the latest uh, process embassies. And we'll keep that going. So I just want to make sure people know that. Uh, but I'll tell you the main, I'll tell you some main changes that are really fundamental changes that you can't see in the literature. And in a year from now, it still probably won't be in the literature because it takes so long to get things in the literature. The first thing is when we do the analysis, we used to do the control condition, meaning we provide all suspected reinforcers for free the whole time. Simple. And we would do it for five minutes usually, and then we'd move on to the test condition. And then the test condition, as most people know, we're going to put an establishing operation in place, which essentially means we're going to progressively remove all the reinforcers. And uh, when be problem behavior of any sort is evoked, we're going to uh, provide them again. The main difference, Matt, is we do not go to the test session after five minutes. I don't do anything based on time anymore. Any decision based on time is probably a bad decision. I do all decisions based on performance. I want the process to be completely sensitive to the learner. Our processes follow the child's lead absurdly. That's the difference. That's not apparent in the literature right now, but it is quite apparent when we provide a process support. So how so are those distinctions? By, yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah, good, good. What do I mean by performance-based, not time-based? I'm not going to put an EO in place until that child has been happy, relaxed, and engaged for at least four minutes. I'm not going to go to the test condition based on five minutes of time. That's arbitrary. For some kids, they may still be reacting. For some kids, they're irritated because they're in a strange place and they're not with their parent, things of that sort. And so we're going to wait until the child settles in and gets engaged with the reinforcers. Uh, let me clarify a couple other things. We never separate parents from their children if they don't want to be separated. If the child goes in the room and is like, ask the parents to leave, the parents have to leave. If the parent, child goes in the room and they want their parents to stay, the parents stay. It's all on the child. Uh, let me take it to that absurd length. We do what we call open door analyses. We don't close doors. If the kid wants to leave the analysis, that teaches us something. So our job in the control condition, Matt, is to put all the reinforcers suspected of influence and problem behavior in that space that we're going to do the analysis in. It might be a room, it might be a the OT room, might be a gym, might be a classroom, might be a three meter by three meter room, what have you. Whatever the company decides they want to run it in, it's always the first start. But the child actually dictates where we're going to do the analysis because if we populate that space with all the suspected reinforcers for problem behavior, and that child doesn't want to be in that room, that means we're wrong, right? If they're willing to smash their head or attack somebody for the reinforcers, right, we're assuming that it's controlled by reinforcement, and we put populate that space with those reinforcers, and the door's open and they choose to leave it, we're going to follow them and we're going to see what they do. Sometimes kids go and they're looking out the window. They love tractor tires and there's construction going on down the road and they love that window because they like looking out. That means our analysis has to be done near that window. Do you see what I'm saying? We yeah. follow the child's lead to an absurd degree. We are not going to put EOs in until that child is happy, relaxed, and engaged with the key word being engagement because the EO is strong when the child's engaged. If the child's roaming around a room, not doing anything but seemingly kind of irritated or reactive, there's no sense putting in EO. We might get problem behavior, but it's probably not uh, emulating the situations under which it occurs outside the analysis. So a main change, set up the control condition before the child gets to the room. It's all this periphery stuff. Uh, when the child walks in the building, they should go directly to the room. You're going to run the analysis, and it should blow their mind. They should enter the room and go, what the what? This is the greatest thing I've ever seen. If they're into fans, there should be four fans there. Do you know what I mean? It should be yeah. awesome. And they should get engaged. And happy, relaxed, and engaged, you know it when you see it. It's, not, it's hard to define before you see a child. That's why I love having parents there. I just turn to the mom and say, how's he doing? Oh my God, I've never seen him so happy. Yes, he's relaxed and engaged. Super, let's see if this continues for a bit. We keep that going. And then once we see that for four or five minutes, then and only then will we put the EO in. Okay, so that's a difference. It's not a fixed time analysis. Every five minutes we change the condition. 
It's simply performance-based. And our first goal is to make sure they're happy, relaxed, and engaged in the next space. And we achieve that by keeping doors open. Okay. Um, I guess cool. the second, yeah, the second part is uh, uh, we don't do control and test conditions per se anymore. Uh, we simply do a reinforcement period. We put the EO in after that five minutes of happy, relaxed, engaged. As soon as problem behavior happens, it goes back to reinforcement. This is a very subtle change. Very important though. We don't put the EO in 30 seconds later. We've been doing that in, in our field for about 40 years now. After 30 seconds, you know, 30 seconds of reinforcement. It's, it's arbitrary, but it just stuck for whatever reason. We're not going to put the EO back in until that child is happy, relaxed, and engaged for 30 seconds. If you do this with language-able kids, and every 30 seconds you stop them from playing that video game to try to walk them over to do algebra that they're not good at, at about the 30 EO, they're going to make a temporal discrimination. In about 25 minutes, they're going to tell you to bug off. At about 26 minutes, they're going to put up their hands like karate chops. Say, Don't you stand up. Don't you come in. You see what I'm saying? Sure. Let me so, ask you this. Um, okay. So uh, just to be clarify. So what you're saying is like you get the, the, the individual gets in the control condition. You observe, make sure they're content. They're, yep. uh, and then is, is it the, the, that the EO is more of a, of, a, of a probe, if you will, than a changing condition or it, by, it by splitting hairs or... No, it's not a probe at all, Matt. It looks just like what it would look like had you transitioned to the test condition. In real time or from the child's experience or watching a, a continuous video, it looks just like any other analysis. Again, the, the distinction is I'm not making decisions based on time. Five minutes, 30 seconds. I'm only making decisions based on a kid's performance. And the design is a little wonky, so it's hard to wrap the heads around. That's why you know it's good to do these, these trainings. But... Basically, if you have to put it in the old parlance, I do one control session and one long ass test session. It's like a single test ISCO, which Josh Jessel and I published on a couple times. Uh, but the single test might be upwards of 25 minutes long. In other words, I put EOs in when the child is engaged and the reinforcement lasts as long as it needs to last for the child to get re-engaged. And then I'm going to put EOs in until the child learns, you know, until the uh, behavior is turned on and turned off. And I'm looking for particular indicators. So before we'd end the analysis after 25 minutes, again, arbitrary, time-based, not smart. We end now when we've controlled behavior because that's the aim. We always tell people, what's the aim of your analysis? Is it to isolate reinforcers, to classify kids, to call them the attention kid or the escape kid? Okay, There's, that's one aim. Another aim is simply to control behavior. I want to be able to turn it off, turn it on quickly. I want to turn it off quickly. And when I turn it off, I want them to get back, resume engagement quickly, because those are the conditions under which we can teach some skills, right? If I turn it on, I know I got motivation. If I turn it off, I got safety. If I go, they go back to engaged, I have a good relationship. That's what I need to teach, right? So. I'm just putting my aim at the front end of my methods. I'm always remembering my aim. My aim is to safely turn on and off behavior and develop a therapeutic relationship so we can teach skills and then generalize them. That's it. So nothing else controls my behavior other than that aim. And the kid's performance is what I'm after then. Yes, turn on, turn off safely, et cetera, and get back to engagement. So I use those things to drive my decision making. Uh, in fact, the the uh, graphs we use now are basically second by second graphs. They look like EEGs. You know what I mean? The, the response happens, it goes up. Uh, there should be no severe behavior in a good analysis. They should be all precursors. Uh, if you see severe behavior, it should be the first two EOs and then it should abate. And so there's all sorts of patterns in these new graphs that teach us whether we're on the right road and uh, nothing's aggregated. Everything gets lost in the aggregation. And again, everything's filmed uh, so that we know that, uh, you know, when there's problem behavior, it's pocketed right in the EO. It's not happening during reinforcement, but all those kind of things. So we have a kind of a level of precision now that is way higher than what we used to have. And it's funny, we, we lack precision as far as what we can tact as the controlling reinforcers. We completely lack that. And we, we've agreed to that and accepted that ignorance years ago. 
But what we won't accept is a lack of precision about whether you've turned it on quickly, turned it off quickly. It's only occurring DEOs and not in reinforcement. The child's engaged. There are no tears. It looks humane and dignifying. Those are non-negotiables. And we achieve those goals now, you know, by putting them up front. Nice. Um, so I, I have some questions about maybe how the process might have changed on the treatment side, but I think Great. let me. Um, I think those answers might reveal themselves when we kind of go through some of the questions here that the listeners sent in. Yeah. Um, okay. If that works for you, we can proceed that yeah, way. And if that, yeah. if anything, then we can kind of just you know uh, summarize uh, when, uh, at some point or another if it makes okay. more sense to do that. So. Um, uh, so we've got a range of questions across uh, a variety of situations and populations and things like that. So uh, I tried to kind of arrange them and, you know, kind of from, from more simple to complex in terms of um, uh, how, how they lay out here. So I'll, I'll start with this one from Jenna. Uh, does Greg teach quote unquote my way to early learners? I'm specifically thinking about kids that I have worked with that have about 15 to 20 man's, using sign or an iPad to communicate. I always get concerned that my way will overgeneralize and they would sign that for everything. If he doesn't use it for early learners, at what point would he introduce it? Is there a certain amount of mans a child should have before introducing it? Good. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, this, is a, this is a complicated area. There's a lot of uh, worries with the omnibus man, uh, the single man that produces multiple uh, reinforcers. And, uh, and I get that. Uh, one thing I, I encourage Janet to do is uh, look for a study by Shannon Ward that will hopefully be out uh, in next year or so. And it really addresses uh, these questions uh, pretty well. Um, but I'll, I'll do my best now. A quick answer. We teach my way or we teach an omnibus man to all children, whether the child has no mans, 15 mans or 600 mans. We, we work with language-able, high IQ kids, uh, okay? We still teach an omnibus man. And I'll tell you why. Because we're about, we're kind of, we have a, a, a process that branches, but in the beginning, it's quite linear. Again, another reason for the company being FTF, it's first things first. First thing is, you know, happy, relaxed, and engaged. Second thing is turn on and turn off quickly, teach the contingency. Third thing replace the problem behavior with a more acceptable response. And that's where the omnibus man comes in. I mean, kids can learn omnibus man in 20 minutes. You're right. I, I see people doing FCT as part of the IEP. So three months, six months, they're still working on that objective. Uh, that, that really need not be the case. Uh, you can teach a man in 20 to 30 minutes if you have a powerful shift from the EO to the reinforcers. And when you have four EOs that take a kid's back and four reinforcers that take a kid forward, you have strong, uh, big motivational distance traveled there. And so the omnibus man can be acquired quickly. Okay, so the fact that it can be acquired quickly means practically you're going to eliminate problem behavior more quickly. So that's why we like it. The issue about the my way over generalizing is she's, Jenna's totally right. It, it will, and it should. It becomes powerful because it's so effective at producing multiple events in our practice sessions. If the child has language, what we see is when they say my way, if that's what we teach them, and we say sure, they then man more during the reinforcement interval because in my way in our saying sure is like a safety signal. It's like the gates to the kingdom of reinforcers are now open and now their mans light up because they know there's gonna be no extinction. We're gonna say yes, yes. Can I do this? Can you play with me? Can you play this way? Of course, of course, of course. So the my way doesn't decrease the probability of mans for kids who have very good man repertoires. If anything, it strengthens it. It makes it more likely for kids to ask us for things because the signal of reinforcement is upon them. For kids that do not have emerging learners, okay, for kids who do not have strong man repertoires, you will see regress with their specific mans. You will see kids say my way and then simply consume all their reinforcers and not manned again. And so that's where uh, Shannon Ward's paper comes in where we teach specific mans after the acquisition of the omnibus man. I still would teach the omnibus man because if you look at a paper by Mashid Gayamagami and I in behavioral interventions in 2015, 
where we tried to teach specific mans for synthesized reinforcers, you have to suffer through 30 plus, in this case, sessions of problem behavior until that entire repertoire is built. The escape response, the tangible response, the attention response. So I would rather you replace problem behavior, eliminate it with the omnibus man, and then go in and teach the specific mans after. Shannon study teaches folks how to do that. So again, summarize the answer, Jenna. We use my way or not my way, but the omnibus man for all kids because it takes the heat out of the situation. It'll increase the odds of mans for kids with very good man repertoires. It may result in regress for kids with weak man repertoires, but we simply rebuild them once there is no more problem behavior. And that's a great time to do language training, not in the thick of problem behavior. All right. Uh, Megan writes in, she was so excited for this opportunity. She pulled a bunch of her colleagues. So they've got a couple of, uh, okay, great. questions related to this. Um, so here's the first one. Uh, when using the ISCA in the home setting, would you recommend making any changes from the posted procedures on your website? Uh, my short answer is hell yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> because we have to update the free website. <clears throat> that, that said, uh, there's a, we have a program now, and it's uh, led by Kelsey Rupel, and it's called Balance. Balance is a home-based problem behavior prevention program that essentially skips the uh, ISCA. And it still has an interview, and we still have EOs and reinforcers, uh, but it goes right into teaching parents how to play with their child, how to create basically reinforcing context and then teaching kids demand for it, and then tolerate denials for it, then engage in contextually appropriate behaviors when they can't have their reinforcers, et cetera. The process is exceptionally similar to our typical assessment and intervention process, but it's geared for the home, it's geared for parents to implement, and it's really geared for young children uh, recently diagnosed with autism that have emerging repertoires of problem behavior, not entrenched, severe problem behavior repertoires. So. When someone asks me about doing the ISC in the home setting, the question always is, how old, how severe, and should we just go do balance? Should we have the parents kind of do the heavy lifting so we don't have to, we won't end up doing parent training, we'll just support them in doing the skill building. And uh, again, if they're young and the behavior's not severe, we'd probably uh, advise and support people implementing the balance program. And uh, we do that now with the company, and that article's uh, in pro uh, being reviewed right now with uh, Jad. Uh, we sometimes do uh, ISCAs in the home when problem behavior is severe. Uh, would I make changes? Uh, they'd be the changes, Matt, that you and I just really discussed. Uh, making Time -based sure, versus especially it's performance-based. Yeah, in the yeah. home. You don't want to be making arbitrary decisions based on time. You, you, uh, there's more risk in the home. Right. Sometimes we're in some really fancy homes and sometimes we're in some really run down homes. Neither home do I want to leave in any worse shape than I found it. Do of you course. see what I'm saying? Safety is paramount. And if you want safety, you don't do a single thing until you get happy, relaxed and engaged. And then when you turn on that behavior, you better be mightily equipped to turn it off, meaning provide all the synthesized reinforcers immediately uh, for the earliest member of the suspected response class. And so it's really the same uh, ISCA uh, practices that we would do elsewhere, but in the home, uh, maybe balance if they're young and emerging, uh, problem behavior, and if anything, just a little more careful because you're in a home. I see. And you mentioned balance, and Celia has a question about balance later on, and maybe we can just kind of uh, uh, address that now. So you did, I think, quickly reference that there isn't. A, uh, you do have a paper coming out on that sometime in the near future. Well, I, I hope it has to get uh, through the process, but I, I uh, the data are pretty strong, so I, I feel like it will. Uh, but uh, I don't want to sound too brash, Matt. But I'm going to say it anyway. <clears throat> I don't use peer review to tell me the truth. Y yeah, you see what I'm saying oh, peer review doesn't yeah. tell me whether the thing is good or bad. Peer review buffs it. Peer review shines it up. Peer review teaches us to write better. Peer review teaches us to interpret with less bias. Peer review teaches us to frame it most appropriately. Peer review makes sure we cite people who have done similar work if we hadn't done our scholarship properly. That's peer review, and I love it for those reasons. But 
I don't wait to teach people how to do certain things until a group of people says good, right? Uh, my group of good scientists, we use good experimental design. If we get through an entire project that takes two to three years and we are effectively controlling behavior and producing socially important outcomes, then we teach people on that process. And balance is exactly in that space right now. And to be honest, PFA was back then, right? I was talking about PFA before it was published. Uh, and, and that's probably what gets me into trouble sometimes. So I'm a little impatient. I'm a little impulsive and I'm a little tired of the glacial pace of uh, peer review. Uh, people need solutions now. So balance is one of those solutions that I wish I could say, Oh, there's 17 articles on it. Here they go. Here they are. There's not. Uh, but my group has vetted it. I believe in it. We've shown it works and we're training people on it. So in October, we're training people at the New, Jer New Jersey Autism Society. I think they're putting on some uh, conference and Kelsey Ruppel and I are gonna uh, do a three hour workshop on balance there. Uh, and then some people are linking up with the company at uh, FTF and uh, we're going out and training them uh, directly on balance. I mean, the deal is, Matt, you know this from your work is there's a lot of people doing home-based and home-based is like the wild, wild west of uh, ABA uh, <laughs> for autism. I mean, there's, it's generally uh, people are following the parent's lead, which I love, but sometimes it's to a fault if a you know, parent wants them to learn their colors, but they're engaging in SIB and they're incontinent and they only eat white food and they sleep three hours a night, you know, we, we might want to reprioritize. So balance is a way to kind of get in a home and get that child ready to learn. Right, you just get rid of the problem behavior. Teach them to communicate. Teach them to tolerate. Teach them to do what people ask them to do. Get get a balanced relationship. That's what it's about. Sometimes it's the child's way. Sometimes it's the parent's way or teacher's way. And once you get that going, you can teach whatever the heck you, you damn well please. And so, uh, balance is a really important curriculum for us because there's a lot of ABA going on in homes, and it's in it. Everyone I think would agree it's less structured and less effective than what we're seeing in center-based or clinic or hospital-based ABA. Usually it's a, it's a gross generalization. Understood. Cool. And um, I will link that uh, training in New Jersey up in the, in the show notes for today's episode. All right, cool. Those yes. in the, of the woods who want to learn more about that. So uh, let's see, Megan continues here. Uh, what would a behavior reduction program look like when challenging behaviors occur predominantly in community settings? Yeah. Yeah. There's another question you mentioned too, about what happens when it's a problem, maybe mainly in the car or the yeah. van. Yeah, that was from Dara. Yeah. 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 I mean, the, the, Similar, the yeah. Thing is, uh, again, part of this first things first model is uh, picking contexts in which the problem occurs that are convenient enough for us and safe enough for us to do the process and uh, develop the skills and we have what we call inconvenient contexts like vans, car rides, churches, public places in the community where we're not going to do the process initially there because we'll have too few sessions with too much gap between them, too much skill decay because of that gap, and generally a messy public process under those conditions, presumably. So what we do, I, I have yet to meet a kid who has kind of really unfortunate behavior in the van or in the community that is just a quiet boy or girl all day in school and in the home. They only have a problem at the mall. They only have a problem in the car. I usually just call BS on that because they almost always have problems elsewhere except they're tamped down by whatever BMOD program is going on at the time and that BMOD program has no traction in the van or in the church or wherever. So what we do is obviously in our process, we're stripping out, we're not using the token boards and everything in, in the process. So in the process, by stripping out the, the, uh, the BMOD program that's tamping down the behavior, we're able to see it, realize it, and uh, shape it into a repertoire under convenient conditions. And then we use the community setting or the van as our generality context. That's the time to go out there, right? You've taught the skills. That's the dignified approach. Kind of mucking with people out in very public places. We got to be very careful with that. I think we should apply our craft under safe conditions, get that repertoire built so that person go on the community effectively 
And, and all we're worried about now is generality. And we have processes by, you know, common exemplars to get there, you know, take bits of the community and emulate it in more convenient conditions. So it's not a satisfying answer. I know whoever asked the question, Megan, or one of her colleagues wants to know, well, what do I do right now for the community thing right now? There is no, there's no magic bullet there. It's like uh, special ed coordinators in schools who want the FBA done on a Monday and they want a treatment on a Tuesday. I don't know who taught people that that is what we do, because it's not what we do. We are skill builders and skill building takes time. And there are some certain situations where you can do an FBA on a Monday and have a treatment on a Tuesday only if the kid has good language. If you can instruct a few things, you might be able to achieve those goals. But if you can't instruct it, then you need time to practice skill building. And uh, same thing with the community. That's a goal that has to be put out there. I just tell people either survive, do whatever you're doing to survive. Don't go in the community that much. That's sad, but true. And give give 25 therapeutic hours to a process that works, and then you'll be right on the community. That could be done in a week if you dose it right. And if you don't have those uh, resources, then, then you know take two months like we used to do in the clinics. Um, okay. All right. That's a thoughtful answer. Great. Um, so, yeah, so, so don't try this at the mall in New Hampshire. Um, no, no. Listen, <laughs> I, I got to be clear, Matt. When these kind of questions come up, I still see myself trying to do a one-person carry of a 220-pound woman through a mall in Rhode Island as she kicked over every single dress stand and everything else she could get her body towards. And that's not who we are. You know what I'm saying? We are not supposed to be the restrainers and the carriers of people. That is you know, such a sad historical accident. We are people who analyze and understand and build skills and coach people and treat them better than anybody in their world. That's who we're supposed to be. And so our, our getting our goals uh, flipped makes us do those things. And so I think if we have our goals right and we remember the sequence is there a place on earth that you can create with a zero problem behavior? If you can't answer that question, we have no business talking about the community, right? First things first, is there any place you can get a zero? Let's get that. Let's start there and then let's, let's put in the fire there. Let's teach the skills there and we'll, we'll proceed. So if we do that, man, we're going to be known for the right stuff. Analyzing, understanding, skill building, not restraining, carrying, having cards in our pocket about why we're doing what we're doing, defending ABA to people who think it's evil and inhumane because it, it certainly looks that way when they see it in the mall. Um, you know what I'm saying. Oh, so I'm yeah. sorry if I'm being said, harsh. I'm not being harsh no, to no, Megan no. or her colleagues. I'm being harsh towards um, where our field is right now, right, and where it could be. Got it. Um, all right, so another question here. What's the difference between a chain schedule versus response chaining versus demand slash instructional fading? <laughs> What about response allocation? So this, that's just a, there's a lot there. So just, I guess, yeah. answer, answer, you know, answer that in any way you, 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 you feel will be helpful. I tell you, I've only been out of the classroom for a handful of months, but these questions scare me. I'm like, I don't know, man, let me go get my Catania textbook and okay. But I'll, I'll give a few thoughts. Um, a change schedule is a, a schedule is when we use the word schedule, we're talking about a rule for what to do with reinforcement. Okay, a schedule is just a rule for what to do with reinforcement. The rule for a change schedule is provided after two or more responses have happened. So that's a change schedule. By contrast, response chaining is the act of linking together two responses. So the schedule just define, describes the rule for delivering reinforcement after two or more responses, but response chaining is the act of linking. And that's done obviously through differential reinforcement, perhaps prompting, etc. So response chaining Again, it's the teaching act and the change schedule is just the rule for what to do with the reinforcer. In other words, in our process, we're doing both, right? We're using a change schedule. Ultimately, the rule is after X many responses provide the reinforcer, but the act of getting them there is response chaining, uh, be a differential reinforcement. Demand instructional fading is just an unfortunate term that we should all probably just stop using. Uh, I think, but I, I, you know, I'm not the boss. I, I'm not good with the, I'd never written an on terms paper, but if I did, I'd probably write one on terms to not use anymore. And this would be it. Uh, fading. There's nothing faded when people say they're doing instructional fading, unless you're talking about fading in, which is the strangest combination 
of words because fade doesn't doesn't make sense in that context. So there's a whole history here that's beyond me and this conversation about uh, in the stimulus control literature. You know, there were the KU researchers Etzel and LeBlanc and and uh, Joe Spradlin and others that did early stimulus control research. And you know, when they used fading, they were really talking about taking a stimulus. Uh, a polar bear and, and changing its morphological features so it eventually turns into a P and, or a B or something of the sort. You know, yeah. you're fading out controlling elements so that it's ultimately controlled by the culturally relevant stimulus, okay? Teaching the distinction between P's and B's is a kind of a classic example. That's where fading lives. Okay. This one, instructional I, fading, I'm not so sure. So instructional fading has been used in the past to refer to response chaining. I think Joe Lally in early 90s did us a, the service of not saying instructional fading anymore. And I think he was the first dude to drop response chaining uh, in lieu of instructional fading. And I think that was uh, uh, the right thing. Um, so okay. uh, that's my answer. Response allocation uh, simply is referring to you use that when there's two or more uh, response options. So response allocation is you sometimes use in studies with matching when they're studying matching and keeping other studies, but you can't talk about response allocation unless there's two measurable responses. And uh, again, people usually talk to talk about response allocation when those options are of similar effort and simultaneously available, and they're trying to understand something about preference or matching or something of the sort. All right. All right, Maria, I mean, uh, Megan, uh, thanks for uh, keeping Greg yeah. on his toes here. <laughs> um, taking me back to school. That's right, that's right. Uh, Daria asks, uh, how can we train a child if in the natural environment their behavior is being reinforced by peers' attention? Yeah. And I th- and it's, I'm assuming that she means by variables that we have less control over, right? Yeah, that's the more general question, right? Variables we don't have control over, and that that's really the... the trick right that's when a case is complex it's often we don't have as much control over the reinforcers uh people often just as a side people ask who do you do this process with and who do you don't who do you not do it with and i I usually draw a little circle and uh one half is cut up by age and the other half is cut up by iq and so we do this process with children independent of iq we do this process with people uh with a low IQ independent of age, the quadrant, the quarter of the circle we don't work with, the, the people that have high IQs and are above 13, let's say, that that's not people we generally work with. And part of the reason uh, we're not working with them is because their reinforcers we can't control. And just to be silly and but somewhat accurate, their reinforcers are sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And we can control one of them, usually. Uh, and... Uh, and so controlling the reinforcer is an important part of this process. Um, and I'm going to give a caveat to that in a minute. But let's get to let's go specifically to peer attention. It's kind of like the community answer. Uh, we had a couple great doc students in our Winnie program advised by other faculty who were really trying to understand uh, peer attention and come up with some assessments that helped practitioners uh, get a better handle on that. And so when they would come to their proposal meetings, they would have some data. And the data was showing that when they arranged Confederate kids to give attention to these uh, kids with problem behavior, these were preschoolers, it wasn't severe, that they were able to turn on and off the behavior with the Confederate peers' attention. They said, look, peer attention is the reinforcer. And the committee all agreed that that was neat. However, if their scholarship was about saying that peer attention itself was the critical variable, it was important then to show that their behavior was not sensitive to other adult attention, right? Because that's a heck of a lot more convenient situation. And so when they went on that mission of isolating peer attention from other more mundane, easy to manipulate forms of therapeutic attention, they were never able to achieve that. In other words, we have yet to find a child for whom peer attention was the only form of attention that was a reinforcer. I have no doubt that peer attention is of a different sort, right? But I remember from school, I know my own kids, when your buddies laugh in the middle of class at your, you know, goofing, goofing off, that is way more powerful than if the paraprofessional in the back of the room uh, gives a little giggle. Oh, and true. so I get that. 
I get that. It's more powerful. But we have to remember it's about being practical. Do we want to put peers in a room with a kid with severe problem behavior? No, we don't. So let's see if a more mundane form of attention can work. Do we want to do the analysis in the classroom? Well, that depends. Does the teacher want you in that classroom? Because if they don't, get the hell out of that classroom. So my point is we don't want to set ourselves up to put ourselves in situations that make it impossible for us to be analytic. The trick is to be analytic. And the second trick is don't put obstacles in your way to be analytic. An obstacle is saying, well, it's maintained by peer attention. I can't get the peers to do what I need to do. I can't control the reinforcer, so I might as well use a Snickers bar DRO. Do you see what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. That, that's what's happening. And so I worry about that uh, a lot. And so instead, I'm, I, I want to teach people, you can be analytic. Yeah, peer attention might be the top dog, but is there other fo- are there other forms of attention that are also reinforcing? Let's work with those. Let's manage those. And let's make the peer attention context the generality context, right? And um, so that's how I would proceed. Awesome. Uh, Dr. Evelyn Gould uh, asks, uh, I want to ask Greg about using the ISCA in pediatric psychiatric settings. I confess this is a completely self-interested question. So if listeners want to, they didn't catch Evelyn's episode, they can go back a few episodes and you can get a better idea of the settings in which she practices in. Um, All right. Uh, I want to start by moving uh, functional analysis into mental health settings, starting with the unit she's working with. Um, so she, I guess her general question is, you know, what, what, what is your take or experience with uh, using these procedures in a kind of non um, ASD, non DD type of application? Good. Yeah, it's a great question. And I have to, this is a little weird for a podcast, Matt, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, <laughs> I love that you're just so willing to just go there. It's, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's podcasting gold. So please continue. Yeah. Well, yeah, this is going to be weird, but even in gold, uh, I owe her an email and she emailed my Winnie account, which got shut down recently because I've been reclassified, but they don't know how to reclassify me. So my email is in some kind of ether, you know, internet space that I can't access. And I know there's an email from her in there and then I can't find her email because she does a great job protecting her identity, I guess. And so I want to talk to Evelyn Gould. I'm saying that on the podcast. Uh, by the time it comes out, presumably I will have spoken to her. I, uh, I will I'm facilitate to... this. I can, I, can, <laughs> I can connect you guys. So Great. I'd love for you to shoot me her email because I want, she's uh, in New England, as folks know, and, and probably know if they know her. And we're right down the road from each other. So uh, the goal is for us to uh, get a conversation going. And I love where she's going. I have a lot of respect for what she does. I have some colleagues here, uh, one in the company, Kelsey Rupel, and another colleague, uh, Corey Whalen, who had started a uh, inpatient hospital uh, unit in Massachusetts. And for financial reasons unrelated to their program, uh, it had to be disbanded. But in the short time they had it together, they were doing PFA and, and this, and it was an autism program, but they brought in uh, some stuff that Evelyn Gould and John Tarbox did uh, related to ACT, and they brought that into their curriculum with parents, and they were really impressed with Evelyn. So I'm really looking forward to talking with her and seeing what she's uh, going to do in the context she's in. Uh, so that, that said, we have worked with kids that are, do not have ASD. And I, so at the clinic out in uh, Springfield, I would say half the kids in our studies did not have ASD, but they were little kids, and that needs to be uh, appreciated. But right before we left the last couple of years, we did work with older kids that did not have an uh, ASD diagnosis, that did not have any cognitive impairment. Uh, they had learning disabilities, uh, and they had psychiatric diagnoses like generalized anxiety disorder, ADHD, uh, et cetera. And we did this process, but it was, there was some wrinkles to it. And these are the wrinkles that uh, hopefully I'll talk to Evelyn about uh, soon. The first wrinkle is open door policy. The child has to have the opportunity to leave whenever they want. And it sounds really strange because most psychiatric uh, mental health units, I, I consulted on them, they lock down facilities and I'm saying, well, open the door. Obviously, I mean, open the door to the session room. Uh, not necessarily the lockdown unit. Sure, yes. Uh, and then second, we have a project that's led by Adithyan Rajaraman, and the model is called the Enhanced Choice Model. And that model is also used in our uh, mealtime problem behavioral food selectivity process that's championed by Holly Gover. 
neither of these studies are out yet, but they're on the cusp of uh, being submitted. Um, they'll be submitted probably in the, this or next month. But basically, this enhanced choice model, whether it's used in for mealtime problem behavior or with kids with good language and psychiatric um, issues, uh, looks like this. When they come into the uh, space, uh, whether it's coming to an cl outpatient clinic or whether they're on an inpatient unit or in a special ed classroom and someone shows up, they basically give them a choice. Do you want to come to practice, which is therapy? Do you want to come to practice? Do you want to come to therapy? Or do you want to stay put? If they come to the clinic, uh, parents bring them there. As soon as they go to the uh, door, we say, do you want to go home or do you want to come in? So we, from the very beginning, honor their choice. What we're trying to do is make sure they know they are not trapped and they do not need to escalate into some foolish behavior to get out of what we're about to do. And so number one is always honoring their words to opt out. Number two is when they come down the room in this enhanced choice model, and there's different variants, so I'm gonna describe what I think is the ideal variant. Uh, there's two rooms, after the analysis is done, there's two rooms. In one room, there's all this same, reinf oh, by the way, in both rooms are set up similarly, the same reinforcers are in both spaces, at least the tangibles. In one room, they get all their reinforcers for free, non-contingent reinforcement. We call it the hangout room. We go in there. We don't degrade the quality of the reinforcers. We're available with our attention. They have toys, continuous escape, what have you, video games, older kids, all that. In the practice space, they earn those same reinforcers. So that's contingent reinforcement. And they earn it in the therapeutic process that we always do. It's just skill-based treatment. At first, you just have to communicate. Then you have to communicate a little better. Then you have to tolerate. Then you have to do some work, what have you. So one room is the practice room. One room is the hangout room. Hangout is non-contingent. Practice is contingent. They get a choice. At any time, they can opt out of the practice room and go hang out. Now, by doing that, we can do the therapeutic process without any escalated problem behavior. Now, it seems absurd that people would choose to go to the practice space when they could get all their reinforcers for free the whole time elsewhere, but they choose to come to the practice space. And why would they do that? Well, there's a whole bunch of non-human animal literature and a bunch of uh, human literature that Holly Gover is, uh, just did a review on, and that'll be submitted soon too, showing this almost a universal preference for contingent over non-contingent reinforcement. In fact, our hero Skinner predicted this a long time ago in one of his articles where he wrote, to work is to be human. He wrote, I think it's in the article of the chapter, The Ethics and uh, compassionate care of the retardate. So it's a horribly named uh, chapter, but again, it was a sign of the times. It's an old, old bit of writing, but he basically was just talking about uh, making sure with dependent populations that you treat them like humans by arranging contingencies. So they engage in more and more effortful behavior to produce important outcomes because that is reinforcing more reinforcing than having your reinforcers simply handed to you. And the really neat part is after that was written, there was a bunch of empirical work done showing that indeed people will choose to earn their reinforcers over getting them for free. In fact, there's animal literature showing that uh, animals will uh, press the lever to produce the food reinforcer rather than eat their food from some freely available stuff sitting in the corner of the chamber. And so this, this universal preference for what we casually call yearning and earning allows us to do processes with danger, kids with dangerous behavior because we can not guarantee but come close to guaranteeing no escalation because they are never trapped. They are never forced to do anything. It is on them. They are electing to do these things. And, and the funny thing too, Matt, is it doesn't mean we don't use extinction. In the practice context, there's extinction but it's a hands-off extinction. You know what I mean? It's, it's, you know, do that work. And if they don't do your work, the reinforcers aren't provided. If you don't like it, again, huffy about it, you can always leave, right? You can go leave and hang out. And, and the funny thing is, in, in uh, Dithion's study, is kids do choose to hang out. Kids do choose to go home. But I don't think we had a kid in that study that chose to do that more than 10% of the time, meaning 90% of the time they hung in there and got through the process and there was no escalated behavior. I think across five kids, there was 10 instances of severe problem behavior for five kids who have a long and strong history of very severe problem behavior. So there's more to it. 
Um, there's a little bit of talky stuff going on with the language able kid. We do reflections after session blocks and have them, you know, put their two cents in and get some buy-in on, on the therapeutic process. But uh, the, the high points were hit. And so if I was Evelyn, and again, I hope to talk to her face-to-face about this, I would really, uh, I think the ISCA, the PFA process and the skill-based treatment process is completely applicable to these kids. Completely. I total confidence there. Before, I wasn't confident applying it because of safety issues. But I'm confident now because the enhanced choice model take, takes the, uh, gives us the confidence, okay? Um, and again, uh, Dithion's project will show some of these learners that do not have ASD, but have these different sort of diagnoses that are, you know, have very severe, dangerous behavior, but yet we didn't see it, and they still got out to a socially meaningful outcome uh, in the process. I uh, look forward to checking that out. Thanks. Great. Okay, so I got another question kind of out of our typical use for this sort of process here, and it comes from uh, uh, Josh, and uh, he said, I've heard several an- animal trainers using or inspired by the ISCA, uh, and he recognizes probably some PR implications to this, but you know, he sees it as a, as a excellent sign that uh, functional assessment is more widely a, a, applicable or at least is, uh, people are attempting to being used. So um, in general, he's interested in any kind of, you know, atypical applications you, you might be aware of. And, you know, I guess what would your thoughts be more generally on applying this sort of approach uh, either in animal training or elsewhere? Yeah, I think that's cool. Uh, I'll be honest, uh, if Joshua uh, hears this at some point, I'd love to know who the animal trainers are. I don't know of any animal trainers doing this. In fact, I've seen a couple articles, I've reviewed them or did something with them uh, in Java where uh, some animal trainers have done uh, standard functional analyses. I think a student of Tim Ballmer is then another uh, UF student down there. Um, and I think it's cool to understand why animals are behaving the way they're behaving, obviously, before we uh, come up with intervention. So I, I think it's applicable. Uh, the standard ones I've read, they, they just sound like synthesized contingencies to me. It's escape the food. It's not one or the other. But, ne- you know, the, you can't isolate those things. But uh, nevertheless, uh, I hope people are doing it. I think it's applicable. And, and I'll tell you why with a non-scientific reason. Uh, to me... A lot of the kids we see, they have trust issues. Yeah, I know. I'm not supposed to talk about these, so I'm going to do it anyway. They don't trust people. Every time someone gets up in their space, they pop their autistic bubble and make them do shit they don't want to do, okay? And that's what I see walking into the situation when I'm seeing that child in the classroom. And this process is about reestablishing trust. This process is about doing the control condition, giving them all this good stuff and getting out of their way, but not leaving them alone. You know what I mean? Being available to them. And when they gauge in some stim stereotypy and they look right at you, you just smile and you're like, yeah, it's good. Go ahead. And when they gauge in whatever baby, you're just available to them. You're not giving them heck and you're letting them do their thing. And then you worsen the situation potentially dreadfully so if you would have been able to progress the EO right up there. And all they got to do is a very simple response and they go right back to that reinforcement interval. And you do that a few times, they start to trust you because each and every time they engage in a behavior, it results in a powerful outcome. And that outcome, you then become acquiescent and available to them. There's some relationship building going on there. Now, if you're working with an animal that has problem behavior, Presumably, they've had some tough experience, some traumatic experience. Presumably, they are now threatened by the human standing above them or within sight of them or within the cage, etc. And so to do a process where you reestablish some kind of trusting relationship, where you teach that uh, non-human animal to be effective in the environment with the human for the minimal amount of behavior, I think that's a good thing. So I say I think because I've never done it and I'm not getting any cages with animals. I have animals at my home, non-human animals and all that, but I, I'm not an animal trainer. And uh, I'd love for people to do it. I think it's a perfect match. Uh, and I'd love to see some research come out on it. As far as, um, you know, extensions of the process, you know, what's funny, Matt, is to me, the most important extensions of the process, people are going to be, they're, they're probably not going to be impressed by 
But if you look at the literature, they're needed. I'll tell you the first one. It's kids. It's uh, not kids. It's adults in group homes. It's adults with developmental disabilities, perhaps without autism, perhaps with. Uh, it doesn't matter. But they're adults with developmental disabilities in residential care. They are way underrepresented in our ABA literature in general. They used to be heavily represented, but, uh, you know, for obvious historical accidents, a lot of people are working with folks on the spectrum, and that's a good thing. And they're working with little kids, and that's an okay thing. I just say okay because there's a lot of adults on the spectrum and adults with DD and adults in residential services with intellectual impairment that have severe problem behavior, and they're not in the literature. That's uh, the, the folks that uh, the PFA process, SPT process being applied to right now with some groups, and I'm really heavily supportive of that. And some of the groups we link up with in our company, uh, we're supporting people in those places with the, that population. That to me is exciting. Maybe not exciting to others because it's not as you know interesting perhaps as the, doing this with animals and tigers and lions and all that, but uh, the people that doing this with tigers and lions. Uh, the second one is uh, kids with head-directed SIB that uh, have heavy protective equipment on and everyone assumes it's automatically reinforced. That, to me, is a very exciting group that we're applying this process with right now. And what I'm learning is that that default of, well, it's automatically reinforced is by and large usually wrong. There are socially mediated events that are controlling the behavior. Um, there have been people that have been whispering this. Well, I, I say whisper because it's one or two articles. Uh, but if you meet them, uh, <laughs> they're actually yelling it uh, in, a, in a scholarly man uh, manner. Franz Van Haren is one of those people. Um, he runs a company down. I met him at University of Florida. He runs a company in Florida, uh, has another company uh, back home um, in Holland. And uh, basically, he's been suggesting that there's a learning pathway that's a little more social for these kids than not. And he's referring mainly to stereotypy. But uh, I think he's on to something, as others have been, when they say that these behaviors are also sensitive to social reinforcers and may be maintained by social reinforcers. Some of these kids, it's, it's the act of getting the equipment back. That's a social reinforcer, folks. That's something we can do something with, we can do something about. So as pragmatists, we're really trying to work with these kids to figure out what can we do outside the skin that can move this behavior around. And that which is left over from treatment is the automatically reinforced stuff. And uh, we're in the early stages of this, uh, but we're seeing some decent progress. And to me, it's a very exciting uh, subset of our population. And what's interesting to me is the two populations I just mentioned are the populations of folks that I started my career working with, adults in group homes and folks with very severe self-injury necessitating uh, equipment. And for some reason, we're just now, uh, my team at least, and my colleagues getting back uh, to this population uh, with the process. So to me, those are very exciting. Uh, what we're also seeing is some people are doing group analyses. So they'll have three or four kids in one analysis because they're grouped in their uh, specialized classroom. And they're seeing some really nice effects doing group-based uh, uh, ISCAs and then group-based uh, skill-based treatment. And uh, there's been some folks at that Praxis organization that uh, does a good job of uh, bringing the good behavior game uh, worldwide. They're doing some of this group-based uh, analysis. And then I have a close colleague named Robin Landa who's doing it uh, uh, to, with great success at the May Institute. And so she shares her data with us every now and then, and it's uh, really impressive. And then finally, I think our, of all of these, I think our greatest opportunity is teaching people that a pragmatic approach to functional assessment treatment is entirely consistent with trauma-informed care approaches. Oh, wow. Think, so you, you th th this is, I can't go anywhere without hearing the, the, the T yeah. word. So yeah, it, it, please. Listen, no. I, I know it's a buzzword and you know me, I'm not a salesman, uh, but I do go to conferences as a speaker and a listener. And I listen and I've been listening to people talk about trauma informed care for some time. I have uh, colleagues at the University of Rochester and, and other places who I've actually been able to share meals with and they've kind of taught me a bit about it. And we're really on the same page. And when I say we, I mean people that do PFA uh, and FC, SBT because we are putting safety first. We are putting a humane treatment of others first. 
we don't put kids in situations where we escalate them. We don't tolerate a kid crying even. If it's operant, wah, and then it turns off immediately, that's fine. We don't put kids to the emotional borderlands where they are meltdown puddles of emotion that no reinforcement can bring them back until an hour or so has passed. That's not ever part of our process. And so when you look at our process, it's entirely consistent with trauma-informed care. Uh, we did a, a month or so ago, we looked at the trauma-informed care website and we looked at some of their schematics. And we took their schematics and we said, we could take this schematic and put it on our website because this is also what we do. And we're really surprised to find the common ground and the linkages, especially coming from at uh, the problem from such different perspectives, right? Uh, but I think that if we refine our process with this enhanced choice model a little bit more, we do a little bit more research, I think we're going to be well positioned to help kids that have well-documented trauma histories because our approach is entirely consistent with trauma-informed care. And I'd say the difference is, and I don't want to tick off trauma-informed care people, and I risk doing so, and if I do, and you, you're a trauma-informed care expert, and I say something asinine, please email me and let's talk. But the issue I have with trauma-informed care, if any, is that the, re the front end part of the process is beautiful. And they identify what those emotional triggers are using their language and remove them from the child to develop therapeutic relationships that are golden. But what I don't see sometimes is the reintroduction of those challenging situations to teach the person skills to get along in an environment where those triggers are mundane events. They're going to happen. It's kind of like treating PTSD by just removing those things and, and hoping they don't come in contact with them by building a lifestyle that is an avoidance-based lifestyle. And that's not part of our process. Yeah, it's, There's no avoidance, no experiential avoidance. It's aggressively, let's get those things back in, but let's do it gently. Let's do it progressively. Okay, so I think we're entirely consistent with the front end of trauma-informed care. I think we have something to offer at the back end, and I'm excited about that. And we're going to start moving, I think, in areas where uh, uh, this stuff is talked about uh, more freely and hopefully make a difference in that area or a, a part of a contribution of things that have already been happening. You know, I've never thought about those parallels, but it makes, it makes complete sense the way you just kind of laid it out. Uh, and, um, you know, when I said I can't go anywhere without hearing tr the word trauma, I, I wasn't saying that, uh, facetiously or d downplaying the, the no, role. No, of I, I don't that. think you were. You um, just, you know, yeah. it's about topic. Oh yeah. It's just, it's just, it's just everywhere. And, uh, so I'm, I'm very glad you brought it up and this is definitely an area I think, uh, uh, I would uh, definitely want to look into a lot more because yeah. I, I, see, I just see it everywhere in my practice, um, yeah. sadly, but it's, 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 uh, it's, it's a thing, so. It is. Um, the other thing to think about, Matt, if I could just extend one more part sure. to this conversation is uh, we now take what we call a universal approach. We just assume that all kids have had a traumatic history, whether we understand whether it's well-documented or not. And if you look at early writings on victimization, I mean, th there's not an adult with developmental disability that probably hasn't been victimized and traumatized. And so I think as ABA people, we need to have uh, a universal approach that just assumes, even with the three-year-old, just assumes that there has been a traumatic experience and make sure your interactions are informed by that assumption. And I think that's a safer way to go than only take a trauma-informed care approach if it's well-documented. Uh, that, that doesn't fly with me for kids that can't speak. Do you know what I mean? Because it's not going to be well-documented when kids can't talk. Yeah. And so... Um, it's something I, I, I hope practitioners start to consider. I know it's changed the game for me. Awesome, man. We can go, we could, we could just talk about that. Uh, Maybe that'll be next time. Uh, 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 yeah. Years. Yeah. There, I hope it's not <laughs> two years before about. the next time we come back. So, <laughs> um, so, uh, so we're going to move on here. Um, last listener question from Darren. Uh, Darren asks, uh, Greg, what is, uh, what do you think about the future of behavior analysis beyond the treatment of autism? Uh, it, especially as it relates to delay and d denial tolerance. And while you're contemplating that answer, he writes a few more sentences, basically telling, telling, uh, telling you how much the schools he works with loves the practical functional assessment approach. So, uh, yeah, so that's a, great. Little bit, a little bit of fan mail going along there, uh, as well. well. So, I anyway, appreciate it. Thanks, Darren. 
Um, I mean, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of people I really admire that say, man, we get, you know, we got to get out and do other things. And there's been some nice articles written in probably the last five, six years, Linda LeBlanc, Pat Fryman, who kind of gave us a blueprint, you know, for moving out uh, and expanding our, I guess, scope of competence. Uh, the challenge is now that we're a profession uh, that we are limited, many people are limited by their scope of practice, which as most listeners know is defined by your state license board. And so what we're really talking about here is expanding your scope of competence is what, what you personally decide is what you're good at. And um, that was recently taught to me by Sean Quigley at an ethics conference over there at Endicott. And I thank him for that. Um, the, Expanding your scope of competence, obviously you got to link up with somebody who knows what they're doing, who is competent. It's all about internships, apprenticeships, graduate school training, et cetera. Um, but our hands are tied until people recognize us as being effective uh, in that area. Uh, licensure has kind of been a blessing and a curse for us expanding our scope of competence because if the license laws say as a BCBA you can do this, well, that's what people are doing. And so their scholarship, if they have the opportunity to do any, is constricted a little bit by those things. So I am a little worried, if anything, now more than ever about BCBAs expanding uh, the scope. However, on the more positive side is uh, my group has been working to expand our scope of practice for quite some time. I mean, I, I work with typically developing kids for a long time in preschoolers. We're now working with kids with psychiatric conditions, and there's no uh, limit on our, our scope, thank goodness, in the state that we're working in. I think what we have to do is link up with colleagues, colleagues like Evelyn Gould, colleagues that have credentials, working with those other populations and engaging collaborative relationships. It's the same thing with all the BCBAs uh, embracing ACT right now. I, I think that's great. I, I like ACT uh, personally. I like ACT professionally. Uh, but I do worry that we are not clinical psychologists, BCBAs. We are trained as BCBAs. And so, you know, some leaders in the field like John Tarbox and others are trying to teach us, you know, what we can take from, uh, from an approach and what we probably should leave behind or need a collaborator to do. And those are exciting conversations. So I'm really taking the answer from that what I've learned from what the ACT folks are doing, and that is that you can take some of it, uh, asking people what their values are and trying to help them make uh, parent, uh, you know, treatment decisions based on those values. You know, we can do that. Uh, there's other parts of the hexaplex that maybe we need to bring in some uh, colleagues to do. Same thing to answer this question. If we want to get our practices out, uh, in something other than autism or problem behavior, we need to start linking up and helping people be highly effective. Uh, I have a, a student right now, her name is Cara LaCroix, and uh, she works at a really nice organization called TACT. And uh, her scholarship right now is uh, doing some dental work, uh, kids with problem behavior at the dentist office. And so we would try and throw our hat in the ring and we had a process that's similar to our typical process, build trust, give kids you know, an out response and opt out, all that. And then in the context of trying to find authentic places to do the research, she came across the dentist and she said, well, listen, my whole practice is about bringing kids in that can't handle dentistry. Why don't you come watch? And so Cara took the time because she's a great person and watched. And this dentist was amazing at what she did. And we learned right quick that we didn't need a new independent variable. They didn't need us. They said this woman simply needed some methodologist to come in and do an experiment to prove the value of what she's doing. And that's probably what CAR is going to end up doing right now. We're in the thick of this uh, as we speak. And so that's an example of we, we might expand our scope of competence by linking up with uh, professionals working in authentic places uh, that we want to be in. Uh, that's probably the route. Got it. Got it. Um, you mentioned the Endicott conference and, uh, I'm going to maybe ask you to, to, uh, answer a question kind of more or less on the spot here. Cause this just occurred. No this kind of just sprung into my mind. Uh, I had some colleagues at that conference and, uh, they said that you, um, just gave a, 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 a wonderful, um, very motivating, uh, talk. Um, but you, you, you really knocked your socks off. Um, <clears throat> and my question isn't about the talk itself, but you're, this is a selfish question because I have, I have a, uh, a conference that I'm presenting at. 
Do you, what, what, are, what are some things that you've learned along the way in terms of giving talks that, um, that, that are meaningful, that, um, uh, you know, it, it's one thing, I guess, to be entertaining, you know, and, and, you know, having attended many of your sessions, I know that they are, but, uh, you know, are, are there, are there a couple of uh, tips or, or, or things like that, that you could impart to the audience of someone's, you know, either talking to, um, a parent group or a group of paraprofessionals or even some colleagues like I'm planning to do, um, what, what, what are, what's some advice you would have for someone who's, who's preparing to, uh, you know, do some public speaking and, you know, trying to kind of try to communicate some of these, these concepts that are, that are, you know, let's, let's face it, can be difficult to, to, to describe. I'd say in the, in the procedure, sometimes even more difficult because the, you know, the, the efficacy is in the details and, uh, Sometimes the general overview talk just, you know, isn't satisfying. Uh, but I'll tell you, the, it's a great question. I think about this a lot. I, I, I care deeply about effective teaching and effective training and uh, presentation. And I've had a great opportunity to work with a lot of super people in the field that have modeled effective ways to teach and communicate. And I've always t- taken notes from them. I've also worked with people that aren't good at it. And uh, they've helped me, too, because they teach me what not to do. I work with the... So I got to be careful here, but a you know, group home manager, which was, he was the epitome of what I didn't want to be. And uh, thank goodness for him. Because when I had that first opportunity to manage a group home, I was so much better having had worked uh, with this guy. But uh, all that said, I think the first thing I would do is uh, look up an article by Pat Fryman. I think it's in the behavior analyst, you know, top 15 tips for presenters. I mean, he's yeah. obviously uh, the field's uh, top presenter in, in my book. And, uh, and he bothered to write about it. And I think he teaches well in that article. So that's something uh, to consider. I think the other thing is um, you really want to make sure you're presenting on something you really give a crap about. I, I, there's something to be said for that. I, I, early in my career, I had to give talks on things. Uh, I used to do volunteer talks at the CASA group, uh, Court Appointed Special Advocates, and I taught about child development. It really wasn't my thing. And I did it for three or four years, uh, every two months or so. And man... I got decent at presenting it, but never good because I didn't care that much. I didn't care about general development stuff. But when I talk about something I care about, uh, it's 10,000 times better. So I always tell people, even if you have an opportunity to present, don't take it unless the opportunity is one where you can talk about something you're passionate about at that moment in time. Not something you used to do, something you're doing right now so it's vivid and it's alive for you. I I think that uh, helps. Um, I think the other thing is understanding your audience and making sure that you understand that they're paying customers and they came there for a reason and time is precious. Saturday afternoon in the summer when it's sunny out, you better bring your A game. You know what I mean? And so I think you want to make sure that you understand what the audience is there for, what their expectations are, and deliver uh, something to them, a consumable, even if it's just ideas, even if it's just inspiration. It doesn't need to be technology, but you, it needs to be something. And uh it sounds too simple, but I want people to understand that there's a process for figuring out whether you have something. And uh, there's a name for it. It's called backward design up at higher in higher ed. There's a name for it called backward design. And if I can just spend a second on it, uh, most teachers teach through forward design. So you get the textbook, you make your syllabus, chapter one, week one, that sort of thing. And then you lecture. And then after your lecture, you go, like, well, I guess I should test. So let me come up with an assessment. You pour through your PowerPoints, you come up with the test. And when you go to grade the test, you kind of look for the best kid's test, and then you make your rubric from that from the geeky kid in the front, and you score the other papers based on that, and then you move on. That's forward design, and it's pretty uh, poor. Uh, backward design, by contrast, is saying, what do you want your kids, the students, to know or do better as a function of that experience? What do you want them to say or do better? And then you design your assessment. How are you going to assess the extent to which you change their verbal behavior or their motor behavior, what have you? And then can you answer the questions, come up with your scoring rubric, and then you design the learning experience, right? You don't even know what your textbook is. You don't know what your articles are. You don't know what your homework assignment is. You don't know what your PowerPoint is going to be until you've gone through that backward process of figuring out what you want them to say or do, what are your objectives, what is your assessment, what is your grading of that assessment, et cetera. I do backward design with talks. I figure out what I want people to know or say differently as a function of that experience. 
And I come up with an assessment, although rarely do I get to administer it, right, at a one-hour talk, but I come up with how would I assess whether or not I achieved that objective? If someone walked out of the room and gave me 15 minutes, what would my assessment be of whether I hit the mark? And I still make the assessment and a rubric for it. And then from there, I design the learning experience, the PowerPoint, the words, uh, and I write out the words. I don't look at them because my eyes are so bad. This is true. I used to kind of read a little bit more. I can't even see it, even with my reading glasses sometimes. Uh, and so I write the words out so I discover what I have to say, but I always uh, hit some marks and miss most. And so I forgive myself for missing some of those things. Um, and I guess the last thing is practice. Uh, I don't want to out people, but the greatest presenters in our field practice a lot. Please don't think they're just like really good communicators that have some oddly low anxiety about talking in front of people. Uh, they're anxious too. And part of that drives the bus to practice repeatedly. So, uh, yeah, that's great. That's great stuff. I, I, I I'm, I'm uh, definitely going to implement, uh, on, on a lot of those. So I appreciate you taking the time to, go off, uh, go, uh, on a little tangent there. Um, yeah, so good luck with the talk. <laughs> oh, thanks. Thanks. Um, uh, all right. In Western mass. Yes. Are yes. The, uh, the tape behavioral conference. Yeah. Um, very good. Very good. All right. So, um, so I guess I have a final thought or question or what have you, um, you reference it very briefly at the beginning of our conversation. Um, and if your comments on it are, you know, uh, sufficient at that point, you can just say so we can just kind of wrap up. But, um, I, so I, there's, there's, there was a little discussion on, uh, in one of the ABA Facebook groups the other day about celebrities in ABA and it was, uh, um, and I, you were, you know, uh, you know, having known you for a couple of years and, um, it, it, you're, you're a remarkably humble guy but I've also been with you at conferences where you can't get across a hotel lobby without a, you know, a bunch of people stopping to take pictures and all sorts of things like that. Um, what, what's that like? Like what, 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 what's the experience like? Um, and, and again, uh, you're, you know, I think one of the things that, that, that makes you personable is that you're like a regular dude, you know, <laughs> like you're just, you know, uh, I I, I, for that. what's that? I thank my family for that. Yeah. yeah. Bringing, as well as present, uh, company, you know, they keep you grounded. Would that be but, pretty much the, uh, the, the intervention there is to, is to spend well, time with people who, who don't care that you're, you know, Dr. Greg Hanley and yeah, I, I, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a cool question. I mean, it makes me a little uncomfortable, Matt, even answering it or I can even acknowledge that kind of stuff. Uh, 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 part of the answer is being grounded. Uh, part of the answer is having friends that don't know you other than, you know, through uh, other life experiences and they have no clue what you do for work and don't care. And if, if they have a clue, they think it's weird anyway and don't want to talk about it. And if someone brings it up in their presence, they're like, stop talking about work. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so, you know, I have brothers that serve that person purpose uh they're supportive and all that but you know they, they know me as as their brother so they they could give a hoot and um you know my family supported and whatnot but but they they ground me right like like any family does and should do uh listen when someone asks me for a picture or want to talk I, I talk to them because i appreciate that I, i'll be honest I, I won't say I don't appreciate acknowledgement of course i do and, and I, all i try to do is try to make sure people know that it's not me or that I'm some, you know, like any behavior else understand some vessel that is shot through some accidental pathway. That's been really great. And so I get the opportunity to, to, to talk about things. And then from that talk or writing, you know, people latch onto it. And, and so I appreciate it. And I also know it's temporary. I also know it's, you know, this is short lived. Just who knows when it's all going to go away. So if someone wants to take a picture with me, I, that's how I'm happy to do that. I think it's great. I take a picture and, but I have mixed feelings. I'm a little embarrassed about it. You know what I mean? I, I, I need to be careful about that kind of stuff. Uh, I know it's an accident. I know it's temporary. Uh, I know it's misleading. I know it's completely misleading. I know who I am because I have people that teach me who I am and I know who I'm not. 
but I don't, I don't disparage anybody who wants to have that conversation. Listen, when I went to KU, my very first job out of grad school, I took my job around that faculty hallway and I had people sign my job of one. I had Don Beer sign it. And I met with Mont Wolf and when Todd Risley came to town, I would talk to him and I invite them to my meetings. And I did that stuff because I appreciated what they did for me. And they, they guided me down a path that, that, you know, incredibly thankful for. So if someone expressed their appreciation to me, I'm just all happy. I, I just, I feel great when people share that appreciation. But I, I try to make it clear that I'm not special because I want people to know that they can do better than I'm doing. You know what I mean? I, I always try to make sure people understand that, that, that they can do this, that there's nothing special here. Uh, they got to get themselves in the right communities. Uh, and I also try to direct the conversation to their process, to the families they've helped, to the child. I want to know those stories. And if they're systematic, I want them to share them with me. And if they're really systematic, I want to help them publish them, which I've done before. Uh, that's really my reinforcers. I want to hear about that kid who was a complete mess and the family was just in complete disarray and taken to a point where there's no more antipsychotics. The child's back home. Everyone's happy. They're out in the community. They're learning. And the kid's back to being who the parents knew he was. I hear that. You stop me and you stop me every time in a hallway at a conference and tell me that stuff. I, I'll be late to my next uh, event for that kind of story. So, again, I have mixed feelings. You, you can appreciate that. And I think as a field, we need to be careful of thinking that these people are, are terribly special. We need to understand that these people have a, a microphone and we should be appreciative and scared of them. <laughs> I like it. And, and we should be empirical and nest in our local communities to make sure we're doing the things that are the best for our clients uh, based on outcomes, evidence, and direct experience with those processes. And uh, But appreciate the vessel, sure. Come up and say, hey, but talk to me about process and families and kids, and, and then I'll really engage that conversation. Awesome. Uh, thank you for such a thoughtful answer to an admittedly awkward question, but a question That's I thought was uh, worth chatting about so uh Glad all right greg um i think we've come to the end of our time here so again i just want to thank you for coming back on the show and uh for for having uh again been such a big supporter of the podcast uh and being so generous with your time on on numerous occasions so i love what you do matt uh, I, and thanks for giving me a voice i, I uh, let my voice be heard i guess i really appreciate it and i appreciate what you're doing and I look forward to your other podcasts. I'll be listening to uh, the Hayes one you just completed. And, and uh, I missed a few, so I got to get back in, in there. I have, a, I have a shorter drive now, so it's harder for me. But um, there you go. But anyways, uh, good luck with everything. And I look forward to seeing you next. All right. Thanks, Greg. All right. Take care, man. Thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at Behavior Podcast.